I'm very pleased to have been invited to speak today, um, and especially on a mammoth piece of work that my team has been undertaking for well over a year. Um, I'm very happy that we have physical copies of the report, that it's done, that you can see it, and that we can talk about it. Um, so yeah, it's a, our recent evaluation on experiences of medication-assisted treatment across Scotland. And today I want to focus particularly on the learning and considerations for practice from this, and also highlight a few positive case studies that we observed. Um, there was negative things as well, which I will touch on, but I think it's really important to learn from, from good things as well um, and see how we can, we can build on that. So, first of all, just a quick acknowledgement to our research team, um, our lead researcher from my team at SDF, Louise Horn, and also um, our peer researchers, some of whom you've already heard from and some of whom you'll hear from after me. Um, the participants who took part, we asked them to be a part of this study for six months um, and to give us a real insight into their life, which most of them were very willing um, and happy to do, and we would not have got all of the conclusions and wonderful things I'm going to tell you about if, if they hadn't done that. Also to staff who supported our recruitment and our observations and to the Scottish Government for uh, partial funding of the work. So just a quick bit of context. Um, so we, work, we did the work across eight different health boards, which are detailed at the bottom of the graph. That is the only graph, so um, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> um, and we aimed for five to ten people from each, um, each of the boards and we chose them just to basically get as good a spread as we could of urban and rural areas um, and to try and get as a representative picture of Scotland as we could. Um, so we had 65 people enrolled um, initially and they took part in an observational study. So that basically meant that they were in touch with us for six months. Um, they would be in touch with Louise fairly regularly um, with check-ins and debriefs following appointments. And they would also have Louise and or one of our peer researchers attend um, an appointment or two with them during that time um, to actually sit in and see what happened and reflect on it together afterwards. Um, they also took part in semi-structured interviews at the three and the six month mark as well um, to give us a bit of a fuller picture. Um, we also ran two focus groups with a total of six male participants in HMP Castle Huntley um, who spoke about their experience of accessing Matt in that establishment other prison establishments as well as the community. So I'm sure that is obvious that there was a mammoth level of data to get through um, and all of it was so varied and rich and valuable. Um, and I could probably spend 20 minutes talking about every individual person that participated. They're all an individual with a complex story, a complex journey, um, and we could learn from all of them. But I have to try and put it into um, kind of main themes and, and findings to, to talk about. So we've grouped them, um, our themes and our considerations into access, choice and support as kind of overarching headings. Um, and that is to mirror our baseline um, project that we did in 2021 ahead of the implementation of the MAT standards, kind of as a point to see where we were working from. So we wanted to, to mirror that. So the headings at the bottom there are just the, the sub-themes that came up around access and what um, come together to kind of form the considerations. Sorry, I'm aware that some of this you can't actually see, but um, I will try and explain it all um, anyway and I should say that all of these quotes um, are from participants so they're from debriefs observations and the um, interviews that I mentioned so our first consideration about access is reducing stigma as we know that is a big problem um, it's not new information um, but it is something that we can't shy away from we need to keep talking about it it needs to be addressed head on um, and continue to be prioritized because we heard and actually saw the impact that stigma, stigmatizing behavior, language, behavior, attitudes, environments can have on people in real time. And as I think um, some of the guys highlighted before me, this is people who are already stigmatizing themselves. They're already feeling crap about themselves and, and often at their lowest point and we're making it more difficult for them rather than easier in a lot of ways. Um, 
so for example the the buildings that people um will go into we had during one of the observations someone say see i just sitting in this kind of dingy cold old building i just feel like people who use drugs were not worth any better than that this is this is what it feels like we're worth um for their treatment and so I really want to emphasise a kind of theme of the whole thing is thinking about small changes. I'm aware that there's a lot of systemic stuff that services are so busy and funding can be tight and things, but really thinking about what are the small changes that we can make and, and that make a big impact. So just thinking about that in terms of our services, is there things that we could do to brighten the place up, um, that type of thing? But actually what's most important is the attitudes and the behaviours of the people inside the building that can overcome a broken chair, a leaky ceiling, um, all sorts of things. Um, so we really want to encourage a, a culture change. It needs to start from, from managers and services to create an environment where staff feel able to have these difficult conversations about languages, about language, call out their colleagues, look at practice, but do it in a really constructive and collaborative way. We had really horrible things that people overheard through these observations. So most often in our team, we, we'll do interviews with people kind of on a one-off basis, whereas this was the first time we'd actually gone in to places with people and followed them over a period of time. So things like one example that sticks out to me is um, Louise was with a, a participant in a waiting room um, and at the reception desk they had pens out and one of the reception staff had said to another one, oh yeah, we can't have pens that are connected by strings here because all this lot will try to hang themselves. And they'd said that loud enough for Louise and this person to hear, so who else was hearing that? And if you're going in for your treatment and that's what you're, the first thing you're hearing, so it's just stuff like that that we should feel empowered to challenge each other on. Obviously, that's a very extreme example and hopefully a one-off, but it's just these things are, are powerful and can um, have an impact on people. Um, so, yeah, think about the training and resources that we already have. And it's there is a lot of good things out there. There's trauma-informed toolkits and, and guides and training, but it's it's not enough to just read them and tick the box and say that you've done them, but actually putting that into practice. Um, the next consideration is around more of the practicalities and logistics of support and access. So again, it's not new information that everybody has individual needs and preferences, um, but we found that unfortunately, waiting times are still quite variable for people. So we had a, a small number of the participants who were actually accessing MAT during the time um, of the evaluation. And there were some people that were able to access same day prescribing, um, that were able to go to drop-ins or, or attend straight away, which was fantastic. So obviously it represents MAT standard one. Um, but there were others who waited weeks and in one case even months months to start a prescription and this was what well, end of last year um so we just need to think about the ways that we can prioritize that things that do work we know what works the drop-in can we widen that um and it's same day if you manage to present on the day that the drop-in is but then if you need to wait another six it's probably not the same day so just thinking what we can do um around things like that um we also found that people have individual preferences when it comes to contact some people myself included, really hate talking on the phone, but we like a text message or a video chat or would rather meet somebody face to face. So just asking people about that and taking that into account um, and also the tone as well. So we still found examples of people being sent letters with kind of threatening undertones of, of um, if you don't turn up, your medication will be um, stopped or cut or, or whatever. But then when they raised that with the worker, they said, oh, that, that's just a generic letter, don't pay any attention to that. But what about the people that don't feel able to challenge that? that so it's just about getting to know people and what they want. And again, it's, it shouldn't be anything too difficult. It's small, small wins, just checking in a, a text in between. Or there was an example of somebody that said they actually find letters quite useful to remind them of their appointments, but that they get quite stressed by mail when it comes in because they might get letters or bills or whatever it is that you get through the post. So they'd spoken to their worker about that and they said, what about if I sent it in a blue envelope? And then you would know that that was a letter from me so you wouldn't have to be stressed about opening it. And that made the world of difference to someone. So it's really little things like that that I think we can learn from. Um, travel, obviously, as we know, can be another barrier for people. Um, so we really need to think about what meeting people where they're at means. That's physically and psychologically. So there was really good examples in rural areas, actually, of different alternative locations being offered. So people could meet them at their house, they could meet them in um, 
go for a walk and a catch up, that type of thing. Um, so we'd really encourage rolling that out again as much as resources and things um, allow people to do. And um, that brings me nicely to our first kind of good practice spotlight. So I've obviously changed names here, but um, this is the example of Simon. So he had been accessing services for several months um, and was always seen at the same building of his choosing um, because it was close to his home. Um, he had a key worker that he'd known for a while and who he talked at length about communication preferences, which were particularly important for Simon because he was deaf. So he had to always be seen in person um, so that he could lip read. Um, and he explained that that had been a barrier in the past and not dealt with. So it was really a big difference that someone was, was kind of accounting for that. Um, so the appointments are always discussed in advance. So at the previous appointment, they'll discuss the plans for the next one um, when he's there. And again, always face to face to make sure he can lip read. Um, I should say that we also always met him face to face and communicated via text, of course, as well. Um, so yeah, text communications and reminders, um, because obviously phone calls wouldn't be appropriate. Um, and the worker always ensured that Simon's bus pass was valid so that he can attend appointments at their clinic and anywhere else he needs to go in person because doing things remotely wasn't an option for him. So again, it doesn't seem like it's anything totally groundbreaking, but just those little things really made him feel valued and motivated to remain engaged in his treatment, whereas before he hadn't had that. Um, so that brings us on to choice. Um, so these are the, the kind of sub-themes from, from choice. So... The first consideration is about the information about the MAT standards. So again, a lot of this has been touched on already, but we found that only 10 out of 65 people when they were enrolling in the study with us had actually heard of the MAT standards, and even fewer of them could tell you what one, two, three of them were, never mind 10. Um, and if we're, we're starting to talk, I think it's amazing that we're starting to talk about human rights and the Charter of Rights and the National Collaborative, all these things are amazing, but if people can't expect their human rights if they don't know what they are and um, that should really be the basic starting point so they should be we made sure to give them um, printouts and handouts and a um, chance to discuss the standards and what they meant for them um, and I know that that's something that happens in our engagement groups and other um, community and uh, settings as well um, and in some services as, um, as was highlighted earlier but I just think it's a really important non-negotiable part to start from when it comes to choice. People don't, won't be able to make informed decisions, informed choices if they don't even know what they're entitled to in the first place. And it just holds people accountable um, and things. And I'm also aware that, that it's a lot for staff. We've interviewed staff in other projects where they say, oh, I'm, I'm not always necessarily confident with the standards or it can feel like quite a lot. So we need to give time and space to our workforce to build their confidence with that so they feel they can empower people about their own rights um, rather than it just feeling like um, they're doing something wrong. So that brings me to um, treatment discussions. So for people to make informed choices that they're happy with, they need to have space for collaborative discussions where they can it's a lot of information at a very stressful time in someone's life and it's a lot to digest and understand so they need to get space. Um, to ask questions and to digest things. Um, so we found that um, methadone was the most commonly offered. It was offered to everyone that was accessing um, MAT during the time and the other forms of buprenorphine were kind of quite varied in how often they were offered um, and things. And it was definitely viewed by most of the participants as the easiest to get. It's the most simple, you know, you can start it straight away. And for some people that worked. Some people thought methadone was great. It was a thing that they understood, so there was less maybe fear or unknowns around it than, than other forms of MAT. But for other people, it was very stigmatised. They didn't want to be on it. Um, so again, it can really vary, and I think that's why it's important that we have collaborative discussions about it, myth bust, give people the chance to, um, to ask questions about medications. Um, and I think it's also, of course, valid that clinical decisions sometimes need to be made from a safety point of view. So it might not always be possible for someone to start on Buvidil right away, or it might not be possible for someone to increase or decrease their dose at the rate that they want to based on a, a number of factors. But what we found happened quite often here is if decisions like that were being made, it was a slight computer says no thing and just that's it, rather than let's explore why that is and help you understand. And in my experience, if people are able to have those discussions and get these reasons explained to them, they're quite happy with that. It's the just being told no with no kind of 
space to think, okay, what do I need to do to get onto that? Or what are my other options? Or do I really understand the medication that, and the dose that I'm already on? Or does it just feel like they're just dictating to me, as I think someone talked about? Um, so yeah, we think that's really important that, and again, if staff feel that they need support from colleagues or time to get more confident with that, they should have it. If they need to be having um, conversations with maybe consultants, or there was really good examples of people having GPs involved in these more medical and clinical conversations. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's really being fully informed and involved in your decisions is, is fundamental to the MAT standards. And if we're not getting that right, we can't really say that we're implementing them fully. Um, so the next um, good practice example is Alan. So during his time in the evaluation, he called a service to self-refer and was offered to attend that day to start a prescription. So a, a really good example of there being a clinic available. And on the phone, even before attending, they introduced his what his options were going to be when he turned up. So I just think that's such an obvious thing <laughs> that doesn't seem to always happen. It's being like, okay, this is what we're coming in. Have you heard of this? Um, this is what you're, is going to happen when, uh, when you get here. So again, from the offset, it was really easing anxiety for him. Um, he saw the worker that he'd spoken to on the phone and it was somebody that he already knew and the options were rediscussed with lots of time for asking questions and digesting the information. He also got physical leaflets if he wanted them. Um, and op so the options were in the waiting room before he even went in, and then he also had further options when he um, was in the room. His dose and titration were explained fully. He felt he knew what to expect. Um, none of it was going to be a surprise, and it, he felt really involved in all of that. So overall, he described um, to the researchers that he felt well-informed, empowered, and confident he'd made the correct choice, which I think is exactly what we want everyone to feel like. Um, and again, I don't feel like those things are, are, are massive... Um, Massive things to ask to do for someone, but could really make a big difference. Um, so finally, this brings me to support. So there was loads of um, things that came up um, about support. Um, so we've tried to condense those into three considerations and a couple of, of case studies. So firstly, therapeutic relationships. So again, I think it was discussed here um, and earlier, just the importance of this. This was from the research team and the participants that this is the most important thing. It overrides the not very nice building, the not being happy that your dose can't change. If you've got someone that really cares about you and that you know and can trust, that will make such a big difference and be the, the motivation and, and the retaining factor in so many cases. Um, but again, it's about staff being given the time and the space to, to do that from the offset. So we really can't underestimate the importance of assigning somebody from the beginning and sticking to that. Obviously, things happen. People leave, people are off sick, or, or things have to change, but really trying to min minimise that. We had a few participants who, during that six months and even before that, um, had only ever been assigned a duty worker, so they never had a named worker, and they talked about feeling like no one was taking responsibility for their care. They were just a number. It didn't really matter if they turned up or not. Um, and then when they had to have these conversations about dose or oh, your dose can't go up or down because you've got cocaine in your system or you can't do this because of that or there was just no trust there it was so impersonal and they just kind of didn't feel there was much point in continuing to to engage so that can really be the difference um for someone so trying to manage duty cover and and changes of workers when they do need to happen um so that again there was an example of someone who they had to have a change of workers i think someone was moving teams um but before they left the worker set up a meeting with them the participant and the new worker so that they could all discuss something all together in the room so again quite a small thing to do but it meant there was no repeating stories or have they passed over the right notes or do you know this or I'm going in and I don't know who I'm going to see so then it just really helps put people at ease and, and make a, a stressful situation that much easier for someone um, and of course we know all this is imperative to trauma informed care but it needs to go beyond just reading reading a policy or, or whatever it's actually what does that mean in practice let's talk to our colleagues about it and and learn from from good examples um, so that brings me to Donna so she was seen at a drop-in clinic, again, for starting Matt, um, and then the person that she met that day was then her allocated worker, so that meant that she knew who, who it was going to be the next time, and she really felt she was building that um, relationship from the word go. So this eliminated anxiety for her about who would be there the next time. Um, and during her titration, she was offered and able to attend weekly, um, again, always with the same person, and during that time, they could start having those discussions about other aspects of Donna's life, and it 
built naturally um, rather than it, it feeling like it was just questions and for the sake of questions or not being asked anything. Um, the key worker remained the same and she engaged every four weeks and was doing so um, for over six months by the time she, um, she left the evaluation. And she said that the main thing that kept her there was this relationship with her worker that she had. Um, next, could we wanted to focus on consistency and provision relating to the standards that are not specifically about medication. So thinking like standard four, standard six, standard nine, um, because this unfortunately just doesn't seem to be happening consistently. I think there is pockets of good practice, but we really need to um, be doing all we can to try and make it as consistent as possible. Harm reduction was a big area where there were a lot of limitations. Um, several participants disclosed um, using other substances um, alongside their mat. So this was often cocaine and um, benzos. But in most cases, when they disclosed that to their worker or it showed up in a test, it became the reason for the computer says, no, you're not getting a change, you're not doing this. But at the same time, there was no discussion around, why do you think you're using these things? What is your pattern of use? Is there a way we could reduce that? This is the reason why we can't change your map because you're using cocaine. It was just all of these things. And actually, we looked through the orange guidelines and it's it's not it's not a light bedtime read. <laughs> I'll give you that. Uh, but I'm not a prescriber um, either. So I know that sometimes, again, these decisions can be affected by a lot of things, but it feels to me like they're... It shouldn't just be a no if someone's topping up. There's got to be more, um, more to it than that and more options. We've had lots of examples of um, stimulant harm reduction interventions that we could offer at the moment, and hopefully we'll get more and more um, things that we can offer. So I think it's just, it shouldn't just be about the mat. It does, it's not just one thing in isolation. All of these other factors are coming in, and there must be a reason that people are, are using on top as well. So not shying away from that and that we need to address it. Um, so yeah, and again, that I guess that comes back to the relationship. If people have someone that they know and trust and feel they can be honest with, they're more likely to have these therapeutic conversations about their other use and be safer um, overall. Mental health, again, I'm probably not seeing a huge amount here that's, um, that's surprising, continues to be a priority. So there were people that were accessing specialist mental health support or on wait list for it. But I think... Um, we need to learn from what we can do in, in standard appointments. So again, there was good examples of psychosocial interventions and those really small things that workers can do that actually, again, make a big difference. So just talking about coping strategies for anxiety um, or kind of group work, and this is where a lot of the third sector stuff um, came in and was so valued by people. So just making sure that people are aware of all their options and what they can access, especially when they're waiting um, for more specialist support. Um, I think through all of this, I, w I want to emphasise that staff should be empowered for what they can do um, at the moment. We, we can't, unfortunately, one person can't make a huge difference to waiting lists um, or knock down a building and rebuild a, an all singing, all dancing one. Um, but you can do little things in appointments that will make a big difference and go a long way with people. We, we emphasise in the report that compassion um, goes a long way and small acts so people talk so gratefully about people picking up a food parcel for them and oh I know she's so busy and that's above and beyond her role but I wouldn't have eaten that weekend if she hadn't picked up that food parcel for me and that's the thing that keeps them in their treatment. I think when um, Sheila was giving the examples of people having the dopamine hits I think actually somebody being nice to you and remembering you and saying, I'm really happy that you're here today, it's really great to see you, that's a dopamine hit. So just thinking about those things that we can change and um, when it might feel like there's so much that we maybe can't um, day to day. So finally, the final consideration is on Bouvidal. So again, this has been kind of discussed before. So we had quite a few participants that were accessing Bouvidal when they um, entered the evaluation or that changed onto it. And for a lot of them, they really described it as game changing, life changing for them. A lot of the time it just felt to give them more flexibility, they're less tied to um, pharmacies or, or things um, and also it can be less stigmatised as, as was discussed. But on the flip side of that we also had people who were on it and then felt that they weren't offered any of the wraparound support, um, that they were only being seen for that five minute injection. Someone even said, oh it's so quick, I just 
leave the taxi meter running. I'm in and out. Um, but, and again, it's a different person they're seeing all the time. And that they still wanted that support, that relationship with someone. So I think it's, it goes back to that individual thing. It's not one size fits all here. So for some people, Bouvidal is, is great with the limited contact. Somebody is ready for that and that gives them freedom and all of these things. But for another person, that's, they still want the psychosocial support and, um, and the monthly or fortnightly contact with someone. So I think we just need to have those conversations and not, not assume things and make sure that Bouvidal has been treated the same way as all the other um, forms of MAT are where we found generally people were getting a bit more consistent um, support. And a lot of these findings about Bouvedal is echoed in things that we found in the engagement groups. There's also reports that people are using um, crack cocaine and benzos more on top of Bouvedal because this other support um, isn't there anymore. So they, they've gone from being seen a lot to not been seen really at all um, and talk about actually being more isolated on it. So I think it's just, it can be so so variable. So not to take away from the good things that it offers people, but just, yeah, knowing that it's nuanced, it's not, um, it's not, what yeah, one size fits all. So um, that just brings me to our final good practice spotlight um, of Sean, who was on Bouvidal. Um, and he spoke monthly with his worker to organise a suitable appointment um, at a day and a time and a place that suited him. So he got his Bouvidal injection monthly followed by a 45 minute appointment. Oh my God, can you imagine seeing your GP for 45 minutes? Um, with a key worker and had a full discussion about how he was hoping and uh, how he was coping and any appropriate steps for treatment. So that was where they would discuss mental health, psychosocial, advocacy, just his life in general. Um, care plan regularly reviewed, uh, with Sean's full involvement and a reduction plan agreed and initiated that he felt confident with and involved in. Um, so these regular appointments meant that he, he trusted and felt he had a really supportive relationship with his worker and the option to be in touch with them in between. So again, this is kind of what you would expect as like a gold standard thing, but it should be offered for Bouvidal as well. So we just find that it's maybe not always um, the case. So finally, before um, we hand over to our panel, um, just some final thoughts and reflections from, from myself and um, the research team as a whole. So I think the observational, observational component was amazing. It was a lot of work, don't get me wrong, but it gave us such a unique understanding of, of what people were going through, day-to-day -day access and treatment. And we were physically making journeys with people so knowing what it feels like to get on a half hour bus in the pouring rain and somebody being really anxious only to get there and get told oh your worker's off sick today sorry your, your appointment's been cancelled someone will be in touch that's what was happening in some cases and just the the impact that that has but on the flip side turning up with someone and it's a worker that they know and they feel like they're having a full hour-long appointment where they talk about everything and it's a, that the positive impact that that has, it's, so, it's just so variable. Um, and these findings were even more enriched by our peer researcher approach um, and the relationships that they had with the participants. And also, I think what was, we'd never done a piece of work like this before um, in my time at SDF, so we didn't really know how well people were gonna engage, were they gonna just talk to us when we phoned them and just tell us the bare minimum, but actually the vast majority of people wanted to share their story, were so hopeful that what that their experiences would help other people. They built up such an amazing relationship with our lead researcher and especially those that were maybe lacking a supportive relationship in the service. They spoke about, oh, if, if, you, if they cared even 10% or took the interest in me, and quite often it would just be they'd just be phoning for a chat just to talk about their life for 15 minutes and that that could be the difference for them. So we were, were quite surprised but really encouraged by that. People want to be heard, people want to engage um, and care about themselves and their treatment, but we just need to give them the, the opportunity for that and, and in a non-judgmental space. Um, so... The consistency and the implementation, I think, is the big thing. As you've seen, there were some really good pockets of good practice, but it just needs to be made more consistent. Um, there's things to build from and learn from, so that should be the next step. Um, and we should always be aiming to empower people in their own treatment, make sure they know their rights and what they're entitled to, um, but also empowering staff to feel like they can 
make a difference and make small changes um, and not be put off by feeling like it's, it's a mountain to climb um, or they're, they're kind of fighting against a lot of different things. So just being able to have that space, that if there's one thing you can do, just getting the, the positive relationships right would be what we would say. So I have got a slide for questions, but what I'm actually going to do, I think, is invite our panel members up and Katie um, to move on to that. So thank you very much. <laughs>